Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We have studied in our unit number five, our, our drama unit, we have studied the play Antigone. We took a brief look at two Ibsen offerings in Doll's House and Enemy of the People. We've now studied Julius Caesar closely. And your textbook company, as it ends this unit, wants us to now take a look at a true classic, uh, Lauren Hans, uh, Hansberry's uh, Raisin in the Sun. Well, I'm, I'm with you on page 1014, 1015 and following. Now, we're only going to do a short cutting from this play, and that's, and that's tragic. My hope is that once you're exposed to a little bit of this play, you'll want to go on and do the entire study of the play. We, like we did before with Antigone and Enemy of the People, we're going to do another one of these comparing literary works. So uh, read with me on 1014 really quickly. We're going to compare characters' motivations. A character's motivation consists of the passions, convictions, ideas, and even illusions that guide his or her actions and shape his or her words. Characters' motivations are almost always at the heart of a story's action, motivating the plot and providing cues to its deeper meaning or theme. To develop your own understanding of a character's motivation, answer the following questions as you read. There is notice five of these that make some sense to pay attention to. One, what goals or desires does a character reveal in a dramatic speech, such as a soliloquy or a monologue? Two, what personality traits and goals does the dialogue reveal? Three, how does the character feel and behave toward other characters? Four, what is the character's family and social background? How does social status contribute to the character's desires? And finally, are there any striking similarities or differences between this character and others? If so, what are they? A character can have more than one motivation, obviously. Think about Brutus, for example, in Julius Caesar. Often, these different motivations conflict with each other. For example, a character's closeness to her family may clash with her desire to travel the world. Both William Shakespeare's The Tragedy of Julius Caesar and Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun feature characters with multiple motivations, such as personal ambition and a desire for dignity. Compare the ideas of dignity that motivate Walter and Mama in A Raisin in the Sun with those motivating Cassius, Brutus, and Caesar in Julius Caesar. And then use the diagram here shown to kind of help with that. Again, one more time on 1015, our big question, to what extent does experience determine what we perceive is crucial. Let's meet uh, Lorraine Hansberry really quickly. 1930 to 1965 are her dates. An important voice, I'm reading with you on 1015, an important voice of the civil rights era. Hansberry grew up in Chicago. She says, quote, both of my parents were strong-minded, civic-minded, exceptionally race-minded people who made enormous sacrifices on behalf of the struggle for civil rights throughout their lifetimes, end quote. Biographical inspiration. When Hansberry was about eight years old, her parents tried to move to a white neighborhood. Property owners in the neighborhood blocked African-American families from purchasing homes there. Hansberry's father fought the restrictions all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where he eventually won his case. Years later, Hansberry used that experience as the basis for her award-winning play, A Raisin in the Sun, which opened on Broadway in 1959. Make sure you have that written down opened on Broadway in 1959. Now let's talk background information for just a moment here. 1017, take a look at it, the background information. We are in Act 1, Scene 2, by the way, of the play. The youngsters are an African-American family living in Chicago sometime after World War II, right? The, the uh, I'm sorry, the, the youngers are a, an Afro African-American family living in Chicago sometime after World War II. During this period, African-Americans faced a shortage of economic opportunities and were deprived of many civil rights. Walter Younger, his, his wife Ruth, and their son Travis, lived with Walter's mother and his younger sister, Benita. Walter's father has passed away. When the family learns that Walter's mother is to receive a check from the father's insurance, Walter pleads with his mother to give him money to invest in a store he wants to open with his friends. She wants instead to purchase a new home and to pay for Benita's education. Now, the name of this play comes from a stanza in a poem we studied in your freshman year and we come back to in our junior year just because it's such an important poem. That poem is called A Dream Deferred. You'll probably remember it by Langston Hughes. In that poem, notice, he asked, you'll remember, what happens to a dream deferred? And, you'll ref and referring to a dream that's been put on hold, Hughes wonders, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? You'll maybe remember this. You can go back 
to, um, um, to LearnStrong.net. You can take a look at this poem and its treatment in uh, the junior folder, by the way, uh, in LearnStrong.net. The verse may, ha may have uh, been on playwright uh, Hansberry's mind as the production struggled to find backing on Broadway because of its all-black cast. Finally, opening on Broadway in 1959, the play gave theatergoers a realistic, uncompromising look at how urban-dwelling African Americans viewed their past, present, and future. The play ran in New York and for two years and earned the New York Drama Critics Circle Award for the Best American Play of 1959. The drama was produced as a film in 1961, starring most of the Broadway class, uh, cast, including Sidney Poitier and uh, Ruby Dee. Now, in this selection, the scene centers on a conflict over what to do with Mama's insurance check. Walter yearns to quit his mundane chauffeur job and make his fortune. His mother, uh, For his mother, the check represents security against poverty. As the scene closes, Mama muses on the, on the changes for African Americans that have occurred in her lifetime, while Walter insists that she will never understand the modern world. So in other words, notice we got some tension, obviously, going on here at multiple levels. All right, let's turn now, and again, our last bit of dramatic study, and let's just enjoy, enjoy this work. From a Raisin in the Sun, Act 1, Scene 2, by Lorraine Hansberry. Walter picks up the check. Do you know what this money means to me? Do you know what this money can do for us? Puts it back. Mama, Mama, I want so many things. Yes, son. I want so many things that they are driving me kind of crazy. Mama, look at me. I'm looking at you. You're a good-looking boy. You've got a job, a nice wife, a fine boy, and... A job. Looks at her. Mama, a job? I open and close car doors all day long. I drive a man around in his limousine, and I say, Yes, sir. No, sir. A very good, sir. Shall I take the drive, sir? Mama, that ain't no kind of job. <laughs> that ain't nothing at all. Mama, I don't know if I can make you understand. Understand what, baby? Sometimes it's like I can see the future stretched out in front of me, just plain as day. The future, Mama, hanging over there at the edge of my days, just waiting for me. A big, looming, blank space full of nothing, just waiting for me. But it don't have to be. Kneeling beside her chair. Mama, sometimes when I'm downtown and I pass them cool, quiet-looking restaurants where them white boys are sitting back and talking about things, sitting there turning deals worth millions of dollars. Sometimes I see guys don't look much older than me. Son, how come you talk so much about money? 10, 18. Because it is life, Mama. Oh, so now it's life. Money is life. Once upon a time, freedom used to be life. Now it's money. I guess the world really do change. No. It was always money, Mama. We just didn't know about it. No, something has changed. You something new, boy. In my time, we was worried about not being lynched and getting to the North if we could, and how to stay alive and still have a pinch of dignity, too. Now here come you and Benitha talking about things we ain't never even thought about hardly, me and your daddy. You ain't satisfied or proud of nothing we done. I mean, that you had a home. That we kept you out of trouble till you was grown. That you don't have to ride to work on the back of nobody's streetcar. You my children. But how different we done become. Walter pats her hand and gets up. You just don't understand, Mama. You just don't understand. Now, this, this play, uh, again, I hope that this will lead you to maybe want to invest some time, energy in, in the study and the viewing of this play. This play really does call into question that generation gap that we've talked about before, stemming even from Margaret Mead's classic essay in the 1970s, Culture and Commitment. That idea that there's something that the older generation just doesn't understand about the younger generation. And in reverse, there's something the younger generation just cannot figure out about the older generation. Dude, what is your problem? That kind of thing. Notice that it all hinges around money. 
It all hinges around the notion of a job and freedom. In this cutting, let's work level one quickly now, then there is a, there's a debate. The son and the mother are trying to come to some resolution over what to do with some money, with this check. The mother can't understand why the son is not happy to just have the menial job that he has. The son, of course, is very interested in the possibility that maybe he can have a real job. That change that has inevitably come now to, the, to, to, to their lives, that change is foundational to how you can command currency, money. What kind of money can you make? Please, Ma, give me a chance. But maybe the most powerful line comes on page 1018. Did you notice what she says to her son? He's, she says about uh, um, both, both, her, uh, uh, both um, him as well as his sister, Benita, talking about things we ain't never even thought about hardly, me and your daddy. You ain't sacrificed, or you ain't satisfied, or proud of nothing we've done. She says it this way. You guys do not appreciate the sacrifices that were made. And because you don't appreciate those sacrifices, we can't understand you, and you can't understand us. She says, it's more than just money. It's about freedom. Let's jump to 2A. What's the primary message here that's being translated in your estimation? Go ahead and jot it down. Some students will report that they see this as the idea of the conflict between two generations and how the two generations can't often understand each other so well. As well, of course, there is that debate about which is more important, money or freedom. And is it, in fact, the case that it's all about money in a capitalist society? And if you don't have that money, you've got no chance of freedom. He says, it's always been like this, Mama. You just didn't understand it at the time. At 2B, notice the power of the symbolism of the check, right? And to just quickly go back at 2B, we, uh, just two pages, remember that we are comparing characters' motivations. What is it that motivates, for example, both Mama as well as her son in this cutting. Finally, at 3A, what is the text for you that is most comparative here? Let's begin with Julius Caesar. The motivations, notice here, of the son versus the motivations of Brutus to want to change things, make things better in the end. And the ways in which the moment that you try to go out there in the world and change things, sometimes there is, in fact, negative energy that is created that you can't so easily control. What is that title for you that comes to mind? And finally, at 3B, when was a time in your life when you were in a similar kind of a conversation, maybe with an adult, where you were talking, for example, about the ideas of, you know, the future versus the past, right? Speaking, of course, of that dynamic tension, you can go back to those two poems that we studied in our poetry unit, right? about the Tiananmen and Square in China um, 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 attacks and, and, and protests. You'll remember all and also all that debate about whether you should just give up or whether you should hold on to dreams of the future. When was the last time you were in one of those kind of situations where maybe you were having a conversation with somebody trying to explain to that somebody who was maybe older, you just don't get it. There's our time and there's your time and your time is so different, which does beg an interesting question in 3B. Let's ask it and you answer it. Do you think it's really that different, you, in a, as a sophomore in high school? Is it really that different from when your parents were sophomores in high school? Or when your grandma or grandpa were sophomores in high school, and, or at that age? Do you think it really is that different? Or rather, has the world not really changed that much? Mama makes that argument. You know, you guys have forgotten the most important things. And the most important things are freedom. It's not money, it's freedom. And dignity, respect. Well, I hope that you'll be motivated to want to pick up this text and read it or view it in its entirety. It's a wonderful text. Thank you.